Praise the Lord. The righteous will never be moved. The righteous will be forever. forever. Do not be afraid, but turn your hearts to the Lord. Our hearts are steady. We will not be afraid. Jesus proclaimed, You are the light of the world. Thanks be to God. Prayer of the day in unison. Faithful desire.
In the strong name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. In mercy, God forgives us our sins and grants us genuine repentance through the grace and power of the Holy Spirit. Hear the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. things going on up here this morning. <laughs> Friends, our Lord Jesus said, you shall love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest in the first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now, as God's own people, be merciful in action. Kindly in heart, humble in mind. Be always ready to forgive as freely as God has forgiven you, and above everything else, be loving and never forget to be thankful for what Christ has done for you. Since God has forgiven us in Christ, let us forgive one another. Peace of Christ and joy be with you. Cartoons, you know where Snoopy always ends up, right? On the on his doghouse, sitting there, uh, often with a typewriter. Now there's this one where he's trying to write a great story, but he seldom gets past the opening sentence. He has, it was a dark and stormy night. Has anyone ever had any dark and stormy nights in your lives? We all have quite a few of them. Nights when the electricity went out and the lights went out. Literally dark and stormy nights, not even emotional ones yet. First, just literal dark and stormy nights. It's kind of scary. You can't see anything in the house, and it's hard to find your way around. It's amazing how much we rely on some of our senses without even realizing it. Until you suddenly don't have that ability, especially if you have any animals running around. They somehow still find a way to trip you. But perhaps we have candles. Anyone have candles at home, especially for especially for storms? You light a candle. Maybe you have a flashlight. Some of us may even have our phones that have an obnoxiously bright flashlight, but it really does the job. The dark and stormy night can be very scary. And it's good to be prepared for such times. But there are some people who live every day of their lives in darkness. They're lost and alone without light to 
show the way home. Imagine just how scary that might be. If our power goes out for a few hours, it can be scary. Imagine if every day of your life, your soul is in that kind of darkness. And we know what they need. Those of us here today know exactly the light, the flashlight they need in their lives. Now, in the Sermon on the Mount, we're about to hear, we're continuing that from last week, this week, and then again next week, we're going to hear Jesus say, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good deeds and praise God in heaven. We can be that light for others by showing them the life of Jesus Christ. If they see that we have that light, they just might want it to. Just like that song we all know from when we were kids. Right? You just know, put a finger in the air, this little light of mine, hide it under a bushel, no, I'm going to let it shine. Let the light of Christ shine in everything you do. Let that light exude out of you so that others who cross your path, no matter how dark their lives might be, can't help but see that light before them. Let's pray. <laughs> Heavenly Lord, we thank you for sending Jesus to be the light of the world. Help us to let his light shine through us so that others will put their faith and trust in him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
is this week we are returning to Corinthians, the first first Corinthians chapter two, verses one to twelve. We're picking up where we left off last week. When I came to you, brothers and sisters, I did not come proclaiming the mystery of God to you in lofty words or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I came to you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. My speech and my proclamation were not with plausible words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might rest not on human wisdom, but on the power of God. Yet among the mature, we do speak wisdom, though it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to perish. But we speak God's wisdom, secret and hidden, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the human heart conceived, what God has prepared for those who love him, these things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything even the depths of God. For what human being knows what is truly human, except the human spirit that is within? So also, no one comprehends what is truly God's, except the spirit of God. Now, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit that is from God, so that we may understand the gifts bestowed on us by God. Word of our Lord. Thanks be God. Have you ever tried to convince someone that you know why they should come to church, why they should have faith at all? It feels impossible sometimes, doesn't it? And if I were to ask you, why are you a Christian? What would you say? What words would you use to convey such a deep, personal response? For instance, would you feel comfortable or confident enough to stand in front of a group of strangers, not knowing their beliefs, and share your faith? And forget the strangers, would you be able to stand up in this pulpit right now and do it? It's hard, it really is. Well, this morning, I have some good news for you, and I have some bad news for you. So let's get the bad news out of the way first. We will never be able to convince someone that they should have faith. No matter how hard we try, no matter how forceful we are, it won't happen. In fact, the harder we try, the worse it may get. Now, that's the bad news. The good news for us today is this. We aren't expected to convince anyone. God does not expect us to share the mysteries of the universe and convince people to have faith. That is the work of God through the Holy Spirit, not through us. However, <laughs> however, this does not mean that we have no role to play. We are called to share our faith. We're called to demonstrate what it means to be a Christian. We're called to share that loving message of Jesus Christ. We are called to share and to demonstrate and then let the Spirit go to work. The problem we have then is in what we say and how we say it. So often, we end up going a bit overboard. 
We so badly want people to believe that we often miss the mark. We try to come up with flowery language to explain our faith. We seek out metaphors and rhetorical tricks to convince people that we are right, that we have the answers, if only they would open up their ears and listen for once. And then, of course, we get stuck in our own thoughts and personal ideas, almost demanding that people agree with us. As we do that, those we started off trying to show the wonders of faith to, well, they begin to push back a little bit and get angrier and angrier. See, the problem is with our communication. We often use aggression, competition, dominance as ways to prove our own superiority, how knowledgeable we are, and why our own understanding is clearly the right one. I mean, we can just look at politics. For example, think of this. When any president wants to make a statement, when they want to argue a policy, what do we say? We say they're using their bully pulpit, right? Because they can reach more people than anyone else. Their words can impact the world immediately. Markets can tumble or skyrocket from one word and one line in one speech. We call it the bully pulpit. See, that's how we describe communication. So it's no wonder it infects other places as well. It infects the church. Because how often do we see people of faith holding signs up condemning others to an eternal hell state? We say that we have all the answers. We know exactly who is right. And we know that we are the right ones. Even if we're completely innocent in our attempts to share faith, we often miss the mark. Maybe we try to use basic, simplistic phrases that we think will stick in people's minds. So we turn to cliches you may see on a poster. Jesus is the answer. All right, Jesus is the answer. But what is the question exactly? Those gimmicky phrases collapse at even the slightest questioning. For instance, one of the most common phrases we hear is, God never gives you more than you can handle. And yeah, I do. We hope it provides comfort for people. All right. But I invite you to come with me to the carrier clinic where I did my chaplaincy internship. To share those words with people who suffered brutal, lifelong trauma. You will see just how quickly, how far that phrase will get you. You'll see just how meaningless those words can be for people. So maybe our problem is that we want to be the ones. We want to be the ones who convince people. We don't use any of those phrases in a flippant way by any means. We genuinely believe they can provide comfort, that they can convince people of God's love and God's faith. Friends, that is not our role. The church needs to be more than a place of daily affirmations in order to convince others to have faith. Well, if that's not our role, what are we supposed to do? Well, maybe we can turn to Paul this morning for an answer. You see, Paul is a firm believer in the KISS method. Now, we all know what that is, right? It's all about keeping it simple. And it's that first S that we want to focus on, why it's vital for us to understand. As that first S does not mean simplistic. The people in Corinth were used to using communication like we do. Through sheer force, we can convince someone to have faith. So the Corinthians we see are fracturing into groups who follow the one they thought had the best skill. Corinthians even accused Paul of lacking rhetorical skills and speaking in too plain of a sense. They thought Paul didn't preach eloquently enough for them. I mean, how can you reduce something so complex as faith into plain language? How can a simplistic answer explain such a complex concept as faith? Now, 
if it were us, we might be insulted by the Corinthian comments. But Paul? Far from it. In fact, Paul saw his lack of rhetorical skills as a qualifying credential in his work. If he used complex language and coercive words, how could anyone be sure that those who converted and found Christ did so because of Christ or because of tricky language? No. No, for Paul, it is all about keeping it as a simple message. And the fact that there is still a church standing in Corinth after he left proves what he is trying to say. Keep it simple. Because simple is not simplistic. And why take two paragraphs to say what can be shared in one sentence? Maybe we think that about some sermons. It's okay, though, don't worry, I understand, and I promise we are getting to the point. So then, what is the simple message Paul wants us to share with the world? God's faithfulness in Christ crucified. Five words. God's faithfulness in Christ crucified. It's nice and simple. God's faithfulness in Christ crucified. Simple, but far from simplistic. So you remember from last week, Corinth was a city in which the people desired a miraculous sign or philosophical wisdom. The Greeks and Romans, they wanted to hear a well-reasoned, well-thought-out argument for why they should have faith and why they should believe in God's faithfulness. And the Jews in town wanted a miraculous sign, like the manna from heaven, the water from the rock, the parting of the Red Sea. And here comes Paul, telling them the answer to God's faithfulness is in Christ crucified. Paul says this is the only answer, and it sounds foolish. It is. God has not revealed the truth through wisdom and signs, but through the Spirit. Paul came to Corinth and shared the message of Christ crucified. And it didn't satisfy anyone's preconceived ideas about, about answers. And yet look, there they stand now as a church, even after he left. So this happened not because of Paul's eloquence, not because of a sign or fantasy rhetoric. It happened only because Paul shared the message, and then God, through the Spirit, went to work in the hearts and minds of the people. And that is the secret. It isn't up to us rather the spirit that gets into the hearts and minds of others and opens them to faith. And there is nothing simplistic about Christ crucified, but it is a simple message that we can share. So if someone asks you, why do you have faith? Maybe start with Paul's answer. Christ gave himself over to death so that we might be redeemed. One sentence that completely encapsulates our faith. One simple sentence whose implications are anything but simplistic. And that is our calling, according to Paul. Share the message of Christ crucified, and then let the Spirit go to work. Because only the Spirit could make sense of the crucifixion of our God to a stranger. Even today, outside our faith, the idea of the leader of a religion or some movement dying for the people, that's a hard pill to swallow. See, we take it for granted, but it is a notion that changed the entire world. And it still can, if we allow it. If we stop trying to force feed our own faith down the throats of the unsuspecting and allow the spirit to do that work, the world could be changed again. If we surrender our own words, our own ideas, our own arguments 
to the will of the Spirit, and the Spirit can do what the Spirit does best. When we surrender our words to the Spirit, then the words we say will join with God and move the hearts of others. When we put our absolute faith in God, well, then we will experience the absolute faith of God. Forget trying to convince people. That is something that we just do not have the ability to do. But God does. Even if it takes a lifetime in some people. God never gives up on them. So that relative you have, the one you cannot get to come to church, stop trying to convince them and let the Spirit work. Share your faith not in a demanding they believe you kind of way. Share, and then trust the Spirit will take hold. One day. Have faith in God's faithfulness shown through Christ crucified. Have faith that God wants all of us home, back with God. It will never stop until we are home. For that person who lost faith for any number of reasons, it can be found again. Only if we let the Spirit work. So when we share our faith with others, forget trying to convince. Instead, share the simple message of Christ crucified with others. And trust that the Spirit will tear down the walls they spent a lifetime building. Remember, while convincing is not our job, we do have a role to play. We share God's love in Christ crucified. We share that God has always been faithful, is always faithful, and will always be faithful. So you've heard me say before that the Bible is the whole story of God's love for us, of God's endless effort to call us back home, and the steps to which God will go to show us faithfulness and love in spite of our divisions, our faults, and our sins. God is so faithful to us. That God sent Jesus Christ to earth, and Jesus loves us so much, cared for humanity so much, that he gave himself over to death so that we might finally come home to God. That is the message we share. That is our role. And then we let the Spirit go to work. Friends, today is all about the faithfulness of God. It's all about the love of God shown in Christ crucified. It's all about trusting the Spirit to do the work that's needed. We take a closer look at the music today. Because it all is meant to share that message. We heard in the prelude of the spirit of gentleness going all over the world, calling humanity to action. From the beginning of creation through the future tomorrow, God and the spirit has been present. Be thou my vision is an ancient hymn, asking God to be our vision, our wisdom. If we have nothing else but God, then we have everything in life. In our anthem from the Worker Choir, we heard the words that we can pray every single day. I need thee every hour. We need God next to us. And God's response is Jesus standing ready to save us in love. And in just a couple minutes, we're going to sing, What Wondrous Love Is This? A song all about the depths of God's faithfulness for us, Christ crucified. An act of pure, wondrous love. And then at the end of the service, we will sing that powerful hymn, Every Time I Feel the Spirit. The words offer us images of the day we are free from sin and can live eternally with God. Now, today is also Communion Sunday. So we will prepare for communion by singing, Let Us Break Bread Together. 
that hymn tells us exactly what we should do. To break bread, to drink the cup, and we should praise God together, all of us as one. And at the table, we remember the depths of God's faithfulness and love for humanity. We remember how Christ died for us, offering his body and his blood for our salvation. Around the table, we invite the Spirit to work in and through all of us. Now that's the mysterious wisdom of which Paul speaks today. Only God can possibly reveal the ultimate truth to us. And God does reveal it. Each time we eat the bread and drink the cup, God reveals that truth. Now it's a truth that will never be revealed in human wisdom. wisdom. How could it be revealed with human wisdom? The truth of God's love, the depths of God's love, can only be revealed by God. So as you dip your bread in the cup this morning, remember that truth. God's faithfulness in Christ crucified. In his death on the cross, Christ offered us the grace of God's forgiveness and love. God's faithfulness in Christ crucified is a simple message that we can take into the world, but it is not simplicity. So after worship today, Share your faith with others. Let the Spirit go to work. Don't worry about convincing. Just share God's faithfulness in Christ crucified. And watch what God in the Spirit does next. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Lord, you have shown your faithfulness to humanity in every generation. Let us remember your wondrous love, that you loved us so much, your Son handed himself over to death, that we might live eternally with you. Let your Spirit be within us, that we trust your Spirit to work in others when we but share your simple, powerful message of your faithfulness in Christ crucified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends, please rise if you're able for our hymn number 215. What wondrous love is this?
please join me as we affirm our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed printed in your bulletins. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. We have a couple of prayer requests we got before the service. Uh, you may have gotten an email from Mark Green earlier this week from Kate. Her mom, uh, Lily, was taken to the hospital earlier this week. So we're praying for her and her family. Uh, from Akbar, we're praying for uh, Kamini, your sister, yeah. right? Uh, who's having uh, who's having a heart surgery coming up? No, but it's completely successful. Okay, so we're, we're praying for a successful uh, completion of a heart surgery. Uh, from Chris, the Bone family, uh, passing of William Bone Jr., uh, which happened, I guess, this week. We're praying for, for his family. Uh, from Cookie, we are praying for Michelle, who broke her foot. Uh, we're also continuing to pray for Michael. Uh, and it's also uh, Phil's birthday in a few days, February 10th. So we're preparing to celebrate Phil's birthday. And also we're praying for Nancy and her family that everyone continues to feel better and can be back in church soon. Uh, lastly, for cooking, we are praying for Fred and Lucy Wright, who are recovering uh, from COVID and other health issues. And then for Bill, we're praying for Daria, uh, who's recovered from major surgery. Are there any other joys or concerns? Yes, yeah, Sue. She is back home, got back home Wednesday. So was told to recover for another week, so we'll certainly continue to pray for her. Um, Andrew, did I see your hand? Yeah. I'm trying to say the title, that was tough. <laughs> Andrea, what's your dad's name? Salvatore. Salvatore, okay. Yeah, Joe. Sure. Well, Michelle and Norman, they have some kind of bug. Michelle and Norman have a kind of bug? Any other joys or concerns to share this week? Yeah, Chris.
this prayer will be part of our communion prayer. So we will, uh, don't worry, I didn't forget the prayer, it will be part of, the, uh, part of the service later. So for now, though, with grateful hearts, let us bring our tithes and our offerings to the God for whom they came. <coughs>
are you who hunger for justice, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who thirst for righteousness, for you will drink deeply of the cup of joy. Blessed are you who yearn for reconciliation, for you will find peace. Blessed are you who are persecuted in the name of religion, for yours is in the commonwealth of heaven. Blessed are we, for Christ calls us to his table, where there is room for everyone and plenty for all. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Friends, the Lord be with you. Also Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, you have brought us this far along the way. In times of bitterness, you did not abandon us, but guided us into the path of love and light. In every age, you sent prophets to make known your loving will for all humanity. The cry of the poor has become your own cry. Our hunger and thirst for justice is your own desire. In the fullness of time, you sent your chosen servant to preach good news to the afflicted, to break bread with the outcast and despised, and to ransom those in bondage to prejudice and sin. Almighty God, through the testimony of those you know, who know your love, you have guided us to ask for what we need. We pray for the church, the community of disciples. Grant that we, who claim the name of Christ, may shine as light into our darkened world. Our brother Paul led the church, not by lofty words of human wisdom, but by wisdom born of your spirit. We pray for those who serve the church, let our pastors and teachers and those who minister in the name of Christ forsake worldly knowledge that perishes and be led by your truth. <laughs> Blessed are those who honor your commandments, O Lord. We pray for our world, for the governments and for its leaders. May all who rule honor justice and compassion and serve the common good that the people may flourish. You teach us to offer food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted. We pray for the sick, the hungry, the poor, the homeless, and those who are oppressed. Let your church minister to those in distress and bear witness to your abiding compassion for all who suffer. We pray for those close to us, for our friends and family that we name now in our hearts and aloud. We pray for Lillian community, for the Bone family. We pray for Michelle and for Michael. We pray for Nancy and her family. Lord, we pray for Fred and Lucy and Daria. We pray for Dot. We pray for Heather and Elaine. We pray for Salvatore and Michelle and Norman we pray for the Maynard family. Lord, we also celebrate Bill's birthday and Andrea's wonderful accomplishment of her children's book being published today. Lord, we give you thanks that on the night of his arrest, Jesus took the bread, and after giving thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Remembering, therefore, his death and resurrection, we await the day when Jesus shall return to free all the earth from the bonds of slavery and death. Come, Lord Jesus, and let the church say, Amen. Amen. Send your Holy Spirit, our Advocate, 
to fill the hearts of all who share this bread and cup with courage and wisdom to pursue love and justice in all the world. Come, spirit of freedom, and let the church say amen. 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 Join our prayers and praise with your prophets and martyrs of every age that rejoicing in the hope of the resurrection, we might live in the freedom and hope of your Son. Through him, with him, in him, in the, uni in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, almighty God, now and forever. And let the church say amen. amen. Friends, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Because there is one loaf, we, many as we are, are one body. For it is one loaf of which we partake. So when we break the bread, is it not a sharing in the body of Christ? When we give thanks over the cup, is it not a sharing in the blood of Christ? Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. If you're unable to come forward, please put your hand up, and Sue will be coming around to bring it to you. Right. God's grace 
you renew us at your table with the bread of life. May this food strengthen us in love and help us to serve you in each other. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, the Lord. Amen. Please rise if you're able for hymn number 66, Every Time I Feel the Spirit. Christ, the true light, shine upon you, that you may walk in righteousness all your days. Jesus said, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to God in heaven. Amen. Amen. 